Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't have any comments to offer at the top. Um, Daphne, you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, thank you. On Gaza, Hamas has said it would not take part in a new round of Gaza ceasefire talks slated for tomorrow. Are your partners in Qatar still working to have Hamas represented? And if so, are you confident that they will end up being represented at the talks? Um, I will let our Qatari partners speak to their own engagements. What I can say is that we are uh, aware of those comments and we fully expect uh, these talks to move forward as they should. Uh, and our point of view is that all negotiators should uh, return to the table and uh, bring this deal to conclusion. It is uh, far time for the remaining hostages to be released, which of course include American citizens, uh, and bring relief to the people of Gaza under the deal that is now on the table. How can they move forward and make progress if Hamas is not there? So, as I said yesterday, um, our Qatari partners have assured us that um, there will be representation um, from ha Hamas, and I will let them, of course, um, speak to that, um, but I'm not going to get into more specifics beyond that. Okay, and what are the remaining sticking points or points on these ceasefire talks? So, as I've said a number of times this week, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of the ongoing negotiations from um, a podium. It certainly wouldn't be helpful to an active and ongoing Process. Has language around a permanent or temporary ceasefire been resolved? Uh, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of the negotiations. Um, Jenny, go ahead. Okay, I try to follow up with Daphne's question. Um, Hamas said they'd be willing to negotiate afterwards if there's a serious response from Israel. How does the U.S. take these comments? So, look, uh, you I spoke to this a little bit this week. Um, uh, when the uh, when President of the United States, um, the President of Egypt, and the Emir of Qatar put out that statement last week, we saw very quickly that uh, the government of Israel confirmed um, that uh, uh, their team was going to be present and will be at the ceasefire talks that are starting tomorrow, um, and that they are prepared to finalize the deals uh, that are on the table. I'm not going to get into more specifics uh, beyond that, um, and we'll just leave it there. Does the U.S. consider the proposals from the Israeli government to be keeping in the spirit of what the President outlined at the end of May? So, uh, our point of view is that the contours that the president outlined at the end of May very much continues to be um, uh, the what is shaping this conversation. But beyond that, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of the negotiations. Uh, Sean, go ahead. Good. Uh, Qatar yeah. and Egypt have uh, announced that uh, both foreign ministers received uh, calls from the Secretary of State today. Uh, do you have any readout for these calls? Uh, we'll have some uh, readouts uh, to offer, I'm sure, um, uh, in the next um, hour or so. We'll have some more to share this afternoon. But uh, these calls are uh, in line with the Secretary's continued engagement on the region and his, the engagement that he's been doing over the past uh, many weeks, talking to counterparts, working to uh, not only uh, stress the importance and the vitality of getting this deal across the finish line, but also uh, making clear to counterparts that um, any escalation is not in anybody's interest and certainly not in the interest of the region. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. Yeah. Um, the, um, yesterday, of course, uh, the State Department notified Congress about uh, $20 billion mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in, in new weapons for Israel. I realize these won't be delivered for a number of years. 2027 20, uh, and onward. But nonetheless, the timing of this, right, you know, just two days before the ceasefire uh, talks. Is, can we see any linkage to that? Is this, uh, this comes, of course, after criticism of some of the far right members. If there was a very strong statement by the secretary on, um, on Minister Ben Gavir's uh, visit to the Al Aqsa Mosque compound slash Temple Mount. Can we see any message in this, particularly in the arms sales? So, Sean, I think the, the important the way to look about th this is that uh, multiple things can be true and multiple things can be uh, uh, vitally in the interest of the United States. First and foremost, we are continuing to work to secure a ceasefire deal that would bring home all the hostages, that would help alleviate the suffering uh, in Gaza. That certainly continues to be a priority for us. Um, simultaneously, we have a longstanding military and security partnership uh, with the government of Israel. Um, we recognize that Israel has a right to defend itself from terrorism and security threats. Uh, we also um, acknowledge and have talked a, a great deal about how Israel continues to face a myriad of threats um, in the region, not just from Iran, but also from its proxies, uh, such as Hamas, such as Hezbollah, such as the Houthis. Uh, that's very much in line with um, what we've been talking about this week. And also is true, Sean, um, that 
there are things, there are actions that we think are counterproductive. We think they are a, a detraction from uh, peace and stability uh, in uh, the Middle East. We also think that they are uh, detractions from Israel's own uh, security. Those things include what we saw uh, Minister um, uh, Ben Gavir do yesterday. It's also when we see things like settlement expansions or uh, things like that. Th those are things that uh, are not just uh, in consistent with international law, they are also uh, again um, detract from our stated goal of a two-state solution and 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 cause greater insecurity in the region. Sure, especially in the arms sale. Yeah, um, I mean, you and, and Matt have been asked numerous times about use of U.S. weapons and in incidents in which civilians were killed. Has there been any? Have there been any further assurances? I mean, is there a confidence going forward with these weapons that have there been any assurances that uh, that more care is being taken that the U.S. weapons aren't? Involved? The, there, of course, is confidence, and as I have. Said, a number of times when we've talked about this issue, there is a long-standing um, security partnership with the government of Israel, one that spans decades. Uh, but that that does not change the tools and the mechanisms that the United States has at its, as its disposal to ensure that our certain U.S. articles uh, are not being used improperly. And that, of course, includes the Turg process, which we've talked about before. That includes the Leahy Vetting Forum. It also includes uh, the policy and guidance that is um, uh, that lives within the conventional arms transfer policy. Uh, and we also continue to have at our disposal um, actions that the United States can take to hold certain entities accountable should we need to. I'll let other people continue. Yeah. Saeed, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, just, you know, well, actually, where uh, Sean uh, left off, on the weapons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're saying that Israel's right to defend itself. We're talking about $20 billion on top of $3.5 billion last week or the week before. It's, you know, paid for by American taxpayers. And that's larger than many, many countries, maybe 70% of all countries in the world. I don't know, I'm not an expert. To be used against defenseless people. Can't you tell the Israelis that they should not, not lower down the amount of damage, but they should not be bombing the places like Tabain School or UNRWA schools or hospitals and so on? Can you tell them that you must not? In every engagement site, in every engagement site, we stress the importance and the strategic and moral imperative our partners in Israel have to minimize impacts uh, on civilians and to minimize right. civilian casualties. That being said, um, Israel absolutely has every right, right to defend itself. It has every right to hold to account the terrorist actors of Hamas that undertook the horrific October 7th terrorist mm -hmm. attack. Uh, and Israel has also every right to uh, defend itself from other uh, malign actors in the region, okay. whether it be Iran, whether it be Hezbollah or the Houthis or otherwise. Does Israel have a right to use Palestinians as human sheet, as was reported in, in, in Haaretz? Are you aware of that report? I've seen that report. Uh, uh, I've seen that report. Do you have any comment on that report? Is there so, any way for you to confirm it? Uh, I, I've seen that report, Said. Um, they are incredibly, these reports, um, they are disturbing, um, and we would urge Israel to immediately and uh, transparently investigate these allegations and hold any uh, potential perpetrators accountable. Uh, Israel has a responsibility to uh, comply with its obligations under international humanitarian law, but I also just want to stress, Said, that they are um, just reports at this point, and that is why um, uh, we would encourage Israel to uh, look into what's going on. All right. Well, you know, many of these weapons used that were actually designed for as bunker busters in Afghanistan, but that's uh, another issue. Let me ask you something. The president said that he expects Iran to hold off uh, on uh, an Israeli attack if Gaza cease fire is reached. How, it, how did the president arrive at this, or how did the government arrive at this? The, are, through direct negotiations, has there been like a promise by the Iranians, if you guys go uh, effectuate a ceasefire? Uh, then we are not going to attack. Uh, I don't have anything else to offer on the president's comment, Said, uh, beyond just saying that uh, uh, getting a ceasefire deal is of vital importance to the region. It uh, could help release the hostages, including the remaining American citizens. It could uh, create the conditions for an increased uh, influx of humanitarian aid. Um, and more importantly, it will help get this region out of these endless cycles of violence that we keep finding ourselves and, uh, talking about. Yeah, on the talks, my final topic, uh, mm -hmm. where Jennifer lived off uh, on the talks. Now, uh, Hamas is saying, look, we're, we're not going in. We already agreed to what was proposed to us back in 31, and so uh, May 31. 
now the Israelis are, are changing their terms. Are you sure they are not? I mean, are the, the, the New York Times reports uh, and authenticated that, in fact, Prime Minister Netanyahu has already changed and has added more demands. Is the proposal is still, main, uh, does it still maintain the same integrity as it was submitted back on May 31? So, Said, I'm just not going to comment on uh, purported or alleged leaks of, of documents and on private diplomatic conversations. What I can say is that uh, the, the, the ongoing conversations have and continue to um, have the contours of the plan that President Biden laid out uh, at the end of May that um, had support from the Arab world, has support from uh, the UN Security Council, has support from allies and partners like NATO and the G7. Um, and that's what we'll continue to remain focused on. But you would agree that if the proposal was changed, then I'm just not no going to get right? into the specifics of the process, Said. No, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, quickly on uh, Austin, if I move to Ukraine after that. Uh, the Secretary issued a statement this morning saying that we have repeatedly offered to find a way to bring him home. And of course, can you please provide with, uh, more details demonstrating you know, what you mean by that? Uh, when I'm did not you going to, to home and when last time? I'm, I'm not going to do that, um, Alex, for the very reason that these are um, uh, issues are, are sensitive. What I can say, and I will just echo what um, the, the Secretary said, is that uh, for more than a quarter of his life, Austin has been uh, separated from his family and uh, held in unknown conditions. We know that the Syrian government um, has held Austin, um, and uh, we have repeatedly offered to find a way to bring them home. Um, we also believe that the um, Syrian government uh, can help uh, end Austin's captivity and provide an accounting of uh, not just um, his whereabouts, but the fate of other Americans who went missing in, in Syria. And this is something that is uh, so personal to not just Secretary Blinken, but also personal to, to President Biden. And this is something that we're going to continue to work around the clock. Just so, just so we understand the timing, by saying we, you mean this administration has offered you in the past three and a half years. Is that the, the case? That is, that is correct. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, on Ukraine, uh, with Assistant Secretary O'Brien being uh, in Kiev, do, can you give us uh, uh, basically the latest update? Do you have a better, uh, better sense of uh, the situation on the ground? Look, um, Alex, our uh, engagement with uh, Kiev and Assistant Secretary O'Brien's visit is continues to be in line with this administration's long support of our Ukrainian partners. Uh, I understand um, he had a number of government-to-government -government engagements on ways in which we can continue to support our Ukrainian partners. Uh, as you saw, I think late last week, uh, we announced another uh, presidential drawdown authority, uh, and I expect we'll continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with our Ukrainian partners. I don't have any um, announcement or anything to preview right now. Though. On, the, on the issue of the question of untying Ukrainian hands, you know, we've been raising the past couple of days, and your answer has been, you know, basically this is based on the you know, situation on the ground, military situation. Now, with Ukraine uh, changing the front line well back into Russia during the past couple of days, why still letting Putin enjoy sanctuary inside Russia. So I'm just not going to preview any uh, actions, Alex, and I will let the, our Ukrainian partners speak to their own military operations. Uh, get one on Ukraine, then I'll go back to that row. Go ahead. Just, um, the, um, uh, the Ukrainians say, said today they're going, they're going to have some sort of buffer zone in, um, in, in, in presumably in Russia, but you know, the Russian-Ukrainian area. I mean, this is something that's tried in mm -hmm. other parts of the world. Um, yeah. uh, does the U.S. have any stance on this, particularly when territorial integrity is what the U.S. is? Uh, I don't have any immediate reaction, Sean. I'd have to uh, have our team uh, look into further uh, what um, the exactly our Ukrainian partners are referring to and what the contours of such a plan would be. So um, I'm happy to check and get back to you. Thanks. Sure. Go ahead. Um, are you able to say whether U.S. weapons are being used in the offensive in Chris? Uh, I will let our Ukrainian partners speak to their own military operations. And what concerns, if any, does the administration have about U.S. weapons potentially being used in the offensive? Uh, look, Daphne, I think we've danced around this um, uh, issue uh, this whole week, and I, I will I will echo what I said to Alex and a couple of others. Again, the only reason that you and I are even having this exchange is because uh, Russia is a country that uh, in February of 2022 uh, attempted to subjugate Ukraine's borders uh, illegally um, uh, and in total violation of uh, of 
the uh, of the UN Charter. And so our responsibility as the United States is to continue to stand with our Ukrainian partners. That's what we'll do as it relates to some of these uh, specific activities. Um, the U S has not been uh, engaged or involved in any of the planning or preparation for that, but uh, we continue to have a responsibility and will stand with our Ukrainian partners as they defend themselves. So is the U.S. okay with it if Ukraine does use U.S. weapons? In this our policy uh, has not changed, Daphne. Thank Shannon, you. go ahead. On Russia, an American national, Joseph Tater, was detained by Moscow for allegedly starting a fight in a hotel. Do you have any information on this case? I and mean, is there any indication that Russia is looking to pick up another American for leverage? I, I don't have specifics, Shannon, uh, given privacy concerns. What I can say is that we're aware of these reports of another uh, American citizen being arrested in Russia, and we're uh, working to get as much information as we can, working to um, ascertain the consular situation and see if consular access is uh, available. But I don't want to speculate uh, beyond that. And on a separate topic, yeah. if I can, Hunter Biden's legal team has confirmed that he reached out to the U.S. ambassador to Italy when his father, the current president, was vice president about potentially closing a lucrative deal for Burisma. Uh, do you have any information on that? Uh, can you confirm that what Hunter Biden's legal team is saying, that there was no uh, meeting, nothing productive came from that outreach? So, uh, look, I will, uh, the, the the department would defer to Mr. Biden's um, uh, representatives on any questions as it relates to his correspondence. Um, I will I will say that the documents that you're uh, referring to uh, were released as part of an ongoing Freedom of Information Act request, uh, and as consistent consistent with um, longstanding department policy, we will be, uh, those documents will be made available to the public in the coming weeks. Uh, we do not have any additional perspective to offer on the production of these documents, given that it is uh, tied up and as part of ongoing litigation. But broadly, let me just say, um, individuals of uh, uh, from, from all over the world and from varying um, uh, sectors uh, seek uh, counsel, advice, um, uh, information from our ambassadors and principal officers at our embassies and consulates around the world. Um, the department uh, takes every uh, responsibility to evaluate those requests on their merits, and we uh, act appropriately. And on those documents, the timing, the New York Times has been seeking them for quite a while. They were only released after the president announced he won't seek re-election. Is there anything to that timing? And the initial letter from Hunter Biden was never released by the State Department. Will uh, the document be made available? I, I would not uh, read into anything into the timing. These um, FOIA processes are long, robust processes, um, and they are, uh, frankly, independent of what else is happening in, in, in the world. But I'm happy to check if we've got anything else to offer on the timeline. Follow yeah, go ahead. Um, it, would you just say, generally speaking, I know you went into some of that detail, would you say, generally speaking, that that is a common practice, that individuals here in the U.S. would reach out to embassies internationally and seek Are you their asking guidance? me if American citizens reach out to embassies and consulates uh, for around their world? For guidance or specifically for introductions so, or meetings, uh, As I said, uh, uh, American citizens uh, of, of varying backgrounds, uh, of varying uh, from varying sectors of, 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 of the world, uh, reach out to our embassies, either directly to staff, either directly to our ambassadors or our principal's officers, um, seeking advice, seeking help, seeking uh, a question, looking for information, looking for a question answered. Um, and the department, uh, we look at that and we uh, act on those based on the merit and we uh, act appropriately um, uh, in, in, in every instance. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, ahead. can we go back to the Middle East uh, sure. again? Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Hochstein works for the White House, but uh, he was in Beirut today. Did he make any progress in his uh, uh, discussions there? And did he bring to the table any new uh, ideas or offers? Uh, again, I will let, I'll let, as you so note, uh, Mr. Hochstein works at the White House, and I will let them speak to any specifics um, uh, as it relates to travel. But uh, I senior administration officials across this um, government are, are laserly focused, whether they work here at the State Department or elsewhere, on uh, doing everything they can to get this ceasefire deal across the finish line or doing everything they can to uh, de-escalate tensions and m make clear to any relevant actor that uh, escalation is not in anybody's interest. On uh, Iran, yeah. a cyber attack uh, targeted uh, the central bank uh, of Iran today and the bank's uh, sector. 
Do you know who was behind uh, the attack, and uh, do you have any comment on I, that? I don't have any uh, any information there. Michelle. And on, on Sudan, uh, too. Uh, okay. Uh, on Sudan, uh, yeah. if you don't mind, what do you expect from the Switzerland uh, talks on uh, Sudan and the absence of uh, the SAF? And why did the U.S. insist on uh, inviting uh, UAE to the talks when uh, SAF considers it involved in the conflict. So uh, today's opening session included international and technical partners. Uh, that included representatives from Switzerland, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, the UAE, the African Union, the United Nations, uh, and we are there uh, with a laser focus on ensuring that the SAF and RSF comply with uh, their JEDA commitments. Uh, in the JEDA declaration, both the SAF and RSF commit to expanded discussions uh, to achieve a permanent cessation of hostilities. Uh, we call on both sides to honor these commitments and to participate in Switzerland. Uh, what is happening in Sudan right now is um, one of the most dire humanitarian situations uh, in the world. And so um, there is a, uh, a moral responsibility uh, of, for the United States and other like-minded partners to try and come together and see uh, what else can be done to help alleviate that situation. I'm not going to get ahead of the talks uh, beyond that, but these talks are going to move forward and we uh, expect them to continue. Uh, Lala, there's a what couple about, more on the Middle East. Let you, me get to that and then we what can about back UAE? to that. Uh, like, why did the U.S. invite uh, the Michelle, U.S.? there are a number of um, relevant countries who um, have a vested interest in seeing a uh, cessation of hostilities in Sudan, and so it's, uh, we welcome any country that is shares that like-minded goal to participate. Just, Nadia. Yeah. Do, just very sorry, yeah. do you expect the Sudan forces to come eventually? Uh, we have stressed that uh, they have a responsibility to, to be there, and we'll continue to make that clear, uh, but I don't have any uh, updates on that. Nadia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, in an interview with AP, a spokesman for Hamas said that uh, he does not believe that the U.S. is an honest broker. And, uh, well, the United said, States doesn't think Hamas is an honest broker. Okay. Oh. Um, so basically, if he says that, and he said that he, they accepted the president proposal, but you guys are not willing to publicly criticize the Israeli, especially Netanyahu, who obstructed these deals many times. Why do you believe that Hamas now is the onus on them to show up in this negotiation? What makes you confident that they have to come? I, I'm not going to. They're not going to come. Nadia, I know you were uh, a couple minutes tardy. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the negotiation process. What I can say is that our partners in Qatar have uh, spoken to us about um, making sure that there is uh, representation from Hamas so that these talks can go forward. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of that process. I spoke a little bit about that this week as well. Uh, more more importantly, though, what is vital here and what uh, no one should lose sight of, whether it's Israel, whether it's Hamas, whether it's any entity, is that this deal is so vitally important for the region and its future. When we are talking about the release of the remaining hostages, including American citizens, we're talking about doing whatever is possible to get an influx of additional humanitarian aid, but also uh, creating the diplomatic conditions to have serious conversations about the future of the region and getting us out of these endless cycles of violence. Okay, considering that you have seen so many U.S. diplomats in the region, including Rick McCark in Cairo and Hochstein in Beirut and William Burns in Doha, and there was talk about the secretary adding into this trip. How do you see success and failure, considering the intensive efforts that the U.S. government is putting on, on this Nadia, negotiation. what we are laserly focused on is doing everything we can to get this deal finalized, uh, agreed upon, and across the finish line. Um, and you have officials across the administration uh, focusing on that. I will let various other entities speak to their own principal's travels, but the secretary, um, as you know, we spoke a little bit about it as you were walking in. He's had, had a number of calls this morning that we'll read out in more detail later, but also has been working the phones over the past uh, many weeks uh, with a clear message to to, to anybody who's on the phone with, that this ceasefire deal is of vital importance and we need to do everything we can to get it done. Uh, and that escalation is in no one's interest and certainly not in the interest of the region. Okay, and just finally, I yep. don't know if you answer this question or not, but you often condemn Hamas for using um, Palestinians as a human shield mm -hmm. and there is this big investigation now by an Israeli newspaper saying that the Israeli army has systematically using Palestinians as a human shield because they believe their lives is superior to the Palestinians. 
So do you condemn the Israelis for using Palestinians for the same purpose that you condemn Hamas? So your um, colleague Said raised this issue uh, before you walked in, and I will just echo that uh, these reports are incredibly disturbing, and uh, we urge Israel to immediately and transparently um, look into these allegations and hold uh, any perpetrators uh, accountable. But I, I also just want to stress, as I as I did with uh, Said, that these are uh, just reports at these at this point, and so uh, what we would call on is for Israel to look into this um, and uh, ascertain what's actually so going what's on. So what's make these reports and the Israel and Hamas using Palestinians as human shields as fact on the ground? There is you're not there and you don't really verify. Nadia, we have. Uh, <laughs> We have with we we know with uh, incredible certainty that Hamas has a clear track record of using uh, civilian infrastructure and protected facilities um, as um, areas of operation, as bases, uh, and using as civilians as human shields. That is uh, not hyperbole. Can I follow up? Sure. On this, uh, you know, Hamas using uh, civilians as human shields. Two weeks ago, I asked you about a photo of Israeli soldiers posing in front of the Turkish-Palestinian Friendship Hospital, and there were also reports that the IDF uh, was using this hospital as their military base. I asked you about this, and you responded by saying, saying that, you know, you asked Israel for further information. Did they get back to you? Do you have any updates on that? I don't have any specifics to offer as it, as it relates to that uh, at this time, but I, I will just echo what I said then in that any kind of uh, violent or kinetic activity so close to a hospital, we certainly uh, would take issue with. But uh, Hamas, of course, does have a track record of using uh, civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, um, as uh, bases of operations. As it relates to what is happening in that picture or the specifics around that operation, I will let our, our partners in Israel speak to. Can I just follow up on some of that? Yeah. In the absence of this uh, ceasefire forced Israeli yeah. agreement, can you give us an update on what you think the achievements of Israel's military campaign in Gaza are? Pardon, Tom. Sorry, I can not hear Do you have an update on what you believe the achievements of Israel's military campaign in Gaza are? So, Tom, it's really not for me to speak to uh, the Israeli, the IDF's achievements or not. Uh, they have uh, every right to not just defend themselves, but to hold uh, the terrorist perpetrators of October 7th to account. Um, they also, uh, we share their stated goal of uh, defeating Hamas, and that continues to be um, uh, what we're focused on as well. In part of when we talk about the future of the region, when we talk about um, uh, what we want to see for the region and the diplomacy that we hope a ceasefire uh, can unlock, we talk about ensuring that the Gaza Strip can no longer be a, a, a springboard uh, of terrorism on the Israeli people. And part of that includes uh, the defeat of Hamas. And that is a line of effort we, uh, of course, support. I mean, I asked the question because it was the 29th of May that the Secretary said it was appropriate to ask how incremental gains against Hamas stacked up against what he described as the unintended but horrific consequences of military action uh, when you're going against people who are embedded with civilians. That was after uh, the deaths of at least 45 people in a tented encampment after an Israeli airstrike. I mean, we've now had reportedly more than 100 people killed in a school uh, in Al-Tabin over the weekend. So are the Israelis making anything more than incremental gains? I mean, it's two and a half months since then. So, Tom, I, I will let our, our partners in IDF speak to their own operations well, and any the progress they're making. This, what what I can say, though, is that uh, you, the, the points you raise just further underscore the, 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 the critical nature of why uh, we're so focused on getting a ceasefire deal uh, across the finish line. It's uh, important that uh, we think that it is uh, truly the, the only lever left when it comes to uh, uh, stopping this, uh, stopping the suffering, stopping the endless Is it the only level of life. A ceasefire? It's not. I mean, you have leverage in terms of stopping arms to Israel. So, um, it's well, not, Tom, it's not we have end. a we have a longstanding uh, security relationship with Israel, and it's totally appropriate if you and others would feel that maybe that perhaps shouldn't be the case. But Israel uh, is in a uh, faces uh, threats from not just Hamas but Iran and other Iranian proxies, and this is a security partnership. Uh, 
that that is going back decades. And I will just stress again, and Sean rightfully added it at the onset of his question, that the uh, uh, security systems that were uh, uh, notified yesterday, uh, we are talking about systems, um, some of which uh, 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 would really have no use in uh, in, in a, such a conflict in Gaza in the first place, but also um, uh, we're talking about systems that the earliest some could be delivered is 2026, with the vast majority of them falling somewhere between 2027 and 2029. Okay, but I mean, when you say it's the only lever, I, the, the, I'm just asking a question, you know, but the, and the, the point is that the secretary two and a half months ago said described incremental gains against Hamas. So that's why I'm asking the question two and a half months later when you've continued um, military assistance relationship that funds Israel's campaign in Gaza. I'm just asking the question, are the gains anything more than incremental against Hamas? Tom, uh, we have come to the conclusion that what the best thing, the path, best path forward is for this uh, ceasefire deal uh, to get across the finish line, and that's what we are uh, lazily focused on. DR. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Sorry. Um, several U.S. officials have said that it's actually not possible to, total, to achieve total victory in defeating Hamas. Given that, does the U.S. really share Israel's goal of defeating Hamas? We do. Uh, we do. Uh, and we think that a ceasefire deal is the first step in uh, a direction of ensuring that the Gaza Strip can no longer be used as a springboard for terrorism against uh, the Israeli people. And do you think it's achievable? Uh, again, I will let our Israeli partners speak to their own operation, but we are committed to doing everything we can to make sure that uh, we get this region out of this endless cycle of violence and that, uh, again, uh, the Gaza Strip can no longer be used as a launching pad for terrorism against Israel. And DR, go ahead. You... Daphne, you've got like six questions. I'm going to work the room. DR, go ahead. There are some reports suggesting that the U.S. and Iraq has reached an agreement about the withdrawal of the U.S. forces in Iraq, and it starts the next month and also the Iraqi foreign minister is scheduled to visit Washington DC to meet with the US officials on this agreement. Do you have anything to share with us on this? So we have held discussions with the uh, government of Iraq on the future of Operation Inherent Resolve uh, since last year. Uh, this includes when Prime Minister uh, Sudani met with President Biden uh, here in D.C. in April. Uh, and at no point did we discuss the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq, but we continue to discuss a the transition uh, to a uh, what we would say a bilateral security partnership, um, as highlighted um, in President uh, in Prime Minister Sudani's uh, readout of his call with uh, Secretary Blinken. These discussions are ongoing, and it is a process that builds on previous bilateral strategic discussions, uh, and it's rooted in what I would say, uh, which is our mutual commitment to security cooperation and a shared interest in regional stability. Uh, but I don't want to get into more specifics beyond that, and I'm sure my colleagues at the and Pentagon no, can no, talk no, more. No agreements been reached between you and Iraq? So uh, and, uh, no, no conclusive uh, assessment to offer. And do you, have, do you have any updates on your diplomatic engagement with Iran about their attacks on Israel. Said asked you about the president's comments. What makes you expect Iran is not attacking Israel if you get a ceasefire deal. So look, I, I, I just, I'm not going to speculate on any kind of timeline or window as it relates to a response or um, uh, any kind of retaliation. What I can say is that um, the sec uh, Secretary Blinken, the President, others across this administration have been deeply engaged in, uh, uh, in, in, in sending a clear message about de-escalation and sending a clear message that um, every uh, thing needs to be done to get the ceasefire deal across the finish line. Jenny, I said you hand up. Iran, is it still the case there's been no direct engagement between the U.S. and Iran? Uh, that is that is the case. That is and the do you case. feel that your deterrence efforts have worked, given that there hasn't been a, a retaliatory I, I just don't want to speculate again on a window or any possible uh, uh, retaliation or response, Jenny. I will use the, the, the chance to, again, echo what, um, what I've said, which is that, you know, in, not, the calls that the Secretary has had today, the calls that he's had earlier this week, last week. Um, he is deeply engaged on this issue and using every possible opportunity to not just stress the importance of getting the deal done, but also stressing the importance of de-escalation. And then to follow up on one thing you said yeah. in response to that Haaretz report, yeah. you called on the Israeli government to transparently look into these. You, The State Department has called a number of times for the Israeli government to look into reports of abuses. Have they ever gotten back to you with any sort of answers the, on these reported abuses that are taking place? There, 
there is a there is a close uh, information sharing relationship between us and Israel. I'm obviously not going to speak to every single um, uh, issue or every single um, uh, incident that's been raised, but there is a close information sharing relationship with with Israel, and we, uh, in this instance, would uh, uh, welcome them sharing more information with us on uh, what transpired. Lalit, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I want to check with you if U.S. is in touch with India on two specific issues mm -hmm. in the region. One, Bangladesh, sure. development in Bangladesh, the security situation, human rights issues, and the restoration of democracy in that country, and also about Prime Minister Modi's uh, trip to Ukraine later this month. Yeah, so uh, first let me start with um, uh, the, the second part of your question. I will let um, uh, the Prime Minister's office speak to any of his own travel. Um, I don't have anything to offer there, but we, of course, are in touch with our Indian partners on uh, a number of issues and, of course, would welcome uh, India's uh, engagement in the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, especially as it relates to ensuring that we get to a just and durable peace that is uh, reflective of uh, uh, what are you Ukrainian partners are, are attempting to do, which is defend their territorial integrity and sovereignty. On the topic of uh, Bangladesh, we have been in touch with uh, our Indian partners as well as other uh, countries in the region to discuss recent events. I'm not going to get into private diplomatic uh, discussions, but we continue to push for an end to violence in Bangladesh, uh, as well as continue to push for accountability and the respect for rule of law. A quick follow-up uh -huh. on Bangladesh. Over the weekend, two Indian-American congressmen Radha Krishna Murthy and Sri Dhanida wrote letters to separate letters to Secretary Blinken mm -hmm. seeking his intervention and help in protecting the lives of Hindus in Bangladesh. Has Secretary received those letters? Is he is he addressing the issues raised by the, these two congressmen? So uh, what I can say is that we engage with partners in Congress regularly. I'm not going to get into specific um, letters or engagements, but let me just note that the uh, interim government, we welcome Dr. Yunus's call for uh, calm and an end to the recent violence of the new, and as well as we, we um, welcome the, the new government's focus on restoring security and the protection of members of minority communities uh, as as well. One more on India. Uh, yeah, go ahead. On annual two plus two, given that the secretary has a very tight schedule this year, elections are happening. Do you think that two plus two will happen this year or will be pushed to next year? Oh man, Lala, that's the, you're asking me to look into a, a crystal ball of what tr what 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 travel and engagements we might have over the the, the next uh, five six months. I don't uh, want to speculate. What I can say is that when it comes to our partnership with India, um, it is robust. It is one that we are uh, focused every day on 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 growing and strengthening, and it's something that I know is shared by our colleagues at the Department of Defense. Uh, but as it relates to any kind of specific two plus two meeting or engagement. Um, I just don't have anything to prove. One or final one uh -huh. I can ask you. What is Secretary's expectations from the new role that he has given to Rich Verma on Ukraine? Yeah. So, um, to take a step back, um, Deputy Secretary for uh, Resources and Management, uh, Rich Verma, is going to be uh, carrying on the work that Special Envoy Penny Pritzker has started uh, when it comes to uh, reconstruction and um, economic uh, uh, issues as it relates to our Ukrainian partners. Um, and really, uh, I think uh, uh, Deputy Verma is going to uh, continue to build on the foundation that uh, Special Envoy Pritzker laid when it comes to uh, private sector engagement when it comes to working with our allies and partners to marshal the economic support that we know is so critical to the future of our Ukrainian partners. Um, the Deputy Verma is a is an experienced diplomat with uh, extensive experience, not just in government, but also in the private sector. And so I think he uh, has a unique uh, uh, position and a unique perch and a unique perspective to bring and uh, continuing to build on um, uh, Special Envoy Pritzker's work. Thank you. In the blue in the back, go ahead. Thank you, Vidan. Yeah. Uh, on Afghanistan, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen, but the Taliban has been posting a video on social media of a military parade online, preparing them showing and operating U.S. weapons. Can you confirm their claims are true? Do you have any comment? Uh, to our knowledge, there. Um, uh, first, I've, let me take a step back. I've not um, seen the the specific video, and so I would have to um, uh, look at that first. But uh, let me just say that 
to date, no country has publicly announced uh, that it recognizes the Taliban uh, as the government of Afghanistan. And uh, we continue to, in close coordination with allies and partners, uh, call on the Taliban that they need to substantially uh, improve their human rights record before any normalizations of, uh, of relations. When it comes to any security systems um, in Afghanistan that may be remaining, I will let our colleagues at the Pentagon speak to that. I think um, uh, Admiral Kirby, when he was at the Pentagon uh, during the withdrawal, spoke a great deal about this. Uh, and I will not just point back to those comments, but uh, defer to the Pentagon. To a quick question on another region. Yeah. Uh, going down to uh, Central America, back in 2023, in December, 11 Nicaraguan pa pastors who were associated with the U.S. ministry were arrested on charges of money laundering. They recently been sentenced to 12 to 15 years in prison or to pay a million dollars in fines, what their representatives have called as a sham trial. What's been the State Department's role in pressing to free these pastors? And is there any progress that's been made since their sentence? I don't have any progress to offer at this moment. What I can say is that this is an issue that we are uh, paying close attention to uh, and deeply engaged on. Uh, the United States maintains that the uh, Nicaraguan government unjustly holds 13 individuals affiliated with the um, evangelical organization Mountain getaway um, in Nicaragua and uh, believe that they are uh, being held solely for exercising their uh, right to freedom of religion or freedom of belief. But I don't have any updates for you uh, there. Go oh. ahead. Me? Yeah. 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 Thank you. A spokesman for Iran's mission to the UN told the Washington Post that his government has no intention or motive to interfere in the U.S. presidential election. Is he telling the truth? Uh, well, the, uh, a report from our uh, Office of uh, uh, National Intelligence would certainly um, say otherwise. Look, um, we have long uh, spoken about how Iran has um, had lines of efforts to maliciously influence uh, elections, not just here in the United States, but elsewhere. Uh, it's something that we are uh, consistently vigilant about as it relates to the United States specifically. Uh, I'm happy that I'm sure colleagues at the FBI and Department of Homeland and security would be happy to speak to some of those uh, deterrent lines of efforts. Just to follow ongoing. up, what can foreign states like Iran, Russia, or China expect if they interfere in the U.S. election process? Have they or will they be warned or sanctioned for trying to undermine the American public's confidence in elections and exacerbate political polarization? Uh, so uh, I'm not going to preview uh, any actions that the United States may or may not take, but with any country, we have been uh, clear and we have been vigilant about uh, uh, stressing to them that uh, they should not uh, maliciously interfere um, in our uh, elections. Ben, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, real quickly on Japan, can I get your reaction to Prime Minister Kishida's announcement that he will not run in next month's LDP uh, leadership election. And what are U.S. expectations of Japan's next leadership? So uh, let me answer the the, the second part uh, first. Uh, the leadership and the governance of Japan is, of course, up to uh, the Japanese uh, people to determine. Uh, and I have no doubt that uh, whoever um, ends up uh, assuming that position and office, uh, that we will continue to deepen our uh, alliance and partnership uh, with, with Japan. Uh, let me just say about uh, Prime Minister Kishida, he has been an extraordinary friend to the United States, and we deeply appreciate his steadfast partnership and his visionary leadership. Uh, under his leadership, the uh, uh, Japan and U.S. alliance has been brought to greater heights, uh, and it is truly evolved into a uh, global partnership where we stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, each other promoting our shared values and interests. His April visit to Washington, D.C., um, where he met with the president, where he spoke to Congress, uh, very clearly highlighted this. And we were very proud to work with Prime Minister Kishida on uh, during his tenure at the G7, as well as uh, issues uh, surrounding condemning Russia's war against Ukraine. All right. Thanks, everybody. One, one more oh, sure, sure. Uh, Go ahead. Just, just Thailand. Yeah. Um, oh, your uh, favorite. <laughs> everybody loves Thailand. Uh, but um, the um, uh, very different uh, yeah. political process in Japan. Um, the, uh, the the constitutional court has sacked the prime minister uh, over the appointment of a minister who had a yeah. conviction. 
uh, I'm not asking you whether the U.S. thinks that people's convictions can run for, for office, but in terms of um, in terms of this, in terms of the political situation in Thailand, this comes after the most popular politician, Mr. Pita, was also disqualified. Yeah. Does the U.S. have any broader concerns about Thailand? Uh, so I, I, saw, I saw what you did there, now you asked that question. Uh, we are, uh, l- let me just take a step back, though, to say that we are aware of today's uh, ruling by the Thai Constitutional Court to dismiss um, Prime Minister uh, uh, of Thailand and the entire cabinet. Uh, we are eagerly waiting and look forward to uh, the selection of not just a new prime minister, but also a smooth transition of power. Uh, our commitment to the U.S.-Thai alliance and partnership does not change. Uh, there is a shared history here, uh, shared interests and common values uh, between both of our countries. Um, and so we will let this uh, process play out, and I don't want to get ahead of that. All right. Thanks, everybody.